The Dallas Federal Reserve Board is suggesting that without Russian oil, we could be facing an imminent recession. And that makes a lot of sense because when energy prices go up, well, that puts a lot of pressure on the economy. And that's what we're going to talk about in today's video. And at the end of this video, I'm going to give you three tips on how to prepare for an impending or maybe not so impending recession somewhere down the road. I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do to make sure you are set up in the worst case scenario. And by the way, that also helps you set yourself up for right now, even if we don't face a recession. But before we get into it, do me that favor, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and please hit that like button so more people like you can see this video. And don't forget about our race to 25,000 subscribers, where when we hit 25,000, we're going to give away $5,000 to one lucky winner just for being subscribed to this channel. So stay tuned. We're only 2,000 subscribers away. We're going to hit 25,000 very, very soon. And when we do, we're going to tell you exactly what you need to do to win that 5,000. In order to get that information, though, hit that subscribe button and make sure you turn on that notification bell. So let's get into it. Let's discuss what's going on in the economy. Once again, talking about inflation, this time talking about a recent study that came out on Monday from the Dallas Federal Reserve, where they talk about the fact that we could face an imminent recession if Russian oil is something that becomes hard to find for an extended period of time. And of course, this is all related to the Ukraine crisis. Yes, I know, I know it's not the Ukraine. I'm talking about the crisis when I say the before Ukraine. Ukraine is the country, the crisis is the crisis, and this all has to do with that and the fact that the longer that this crisis ensues and the longer that Russian energy is being withheld from Europe could have pretty dire consequences on basically the global economy. So what the Dallas Federal Reserve is talking about here is not a United States recession. They're talking about a global recession due to the lack of energy available and therefore higher prices. And that obviously trickles down to pretty much everything that's available in the economy because most things are getting transported. People have to drive to work. People have to heat their homes. Thank goodness we are going into summer and that is getting less expensive, at least here in Canada and the United States. But yes, this is something that we are paying attention to and something that we have to watch because, like I said, it will be unavoidable if we have high oil prices for a long period of time. And by the way, high oil prices are typically synonymous with recessions. As soon as the prices of everything go up, while well, incomes don't necessarily go up as fast, is typically when you start to see people buying less, spending less money on things that aren't energy to heat their home. And subsequently, that's why you end up with recessions and periods like this. And if you go and you take a look at this article, it's really, really interesting. This graph here is oil price spikes associated with some of the past downturns. You can see that early 1990, this is the Iraq invasion of Kuwait. We saw a global downturn here as oil prices went up quite substantially. You can see that leading up to the global financial crisis, oil prices got quite high as well. And then subsequently, you can see that just before the pandemic here, we were starting to see oil prices rise. Of course, they dropped in 2014 to 2015. They looked like they were about to make a comeback and then the pandemic hit and we ended up in a scenario where oil prices pretty much went to nothing. In fact, in Alberta here in April of 2020, just after the pandemic started, I was able to fill up my tank of gas for 37.9 cents. That was the lowest gas prices I'd seen in 22 years since I had started driving, where I paid 39.9 the very first time that I filled up for a tank of gas. So, you know, this is something that we watch. It's something that is common when you see higher energy prices. It typically puts downward pressure on the economy and therefore it leads to recessions. Now, if you look at YouTube right now and you look at a lot of the news articles out there, there are a lot of people talking about recession and they're talking about this because of the two year and the 10 year bond yields and what's called the yield curve. And basically what happens is when that yield curve turns negative, where the 10 year yield is lower or about the same as what the two year yield would be, that's usually indicative of a recession, although not always. And what's interesting is Jerome Powell came out this week and said, if you want a better look at what would cause a recession from a yield curve perspective, you need to look at the short term yield curve. Now, if you go down here and take a look at this graph, this is the inversion of short term rates. So basically, it's 18 month rates, less three month rates. And what this means in a really simplistic term, because bonds are obviously very complicated and bond yields 
fields are complicated. But what this number means is that when it gets really low, which is down here in the negative territory of this graph, is it usually means that there's a recession imminent. And that is because the markets are expecting that the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada will decrease interest rates at some point in the next 18 months. That's the expectation when you see this number get really low. Now, if you look at where it is right now, it's quite high relative to pretty much any time going back to 1996. So what that tells us is that the market is not expecting any sort of rate decreases in the next 18 months. Now, interestingly enough, they're expecting one in late 2020 Four. That's what the market's predicting right now. And of course, that is a long runway out. But as of right now, this is not indicative of a recession. But again, we can't do things like ignore oil costs, inflation, higher costs. And specifically, if you look at what the Bank of England talked about, which we talked about in our video yesterday, that's that inflation will eventually fight inflation because the higher prices get, the less money people have, and therefore the less they will buy, and that will put downward pressure on prices. Now, it can have the opposite effect. You can have people asking for more money from their employers, and if they're able to get it, that would lead to higher wages and therefore more money to spend. Now, in an economy where the economy is not growing, but we have high inflation, getting higher wages becomes very hard. So that's probably not going to be an issue this time around. But the problem that we could face is if people start buying things in advance because they believe that they will not be able to buy them ever again at this price, it could cause more inflation and it could compound on itself, which ironically is probably gonna be one of the recommendations I make to you at the end, but we'll get to that in a second here. Now, here's where it gets really, really interesting because the National Bank of Canada has done an analysis on higher food costs and higher energy costs. And what they're predicting is that the higher food and the higher energy costs right now are going to dwarf any sort of Bank of Canada rate increases over the next little while. In fact, they've done a calculation on this, which is pretty easy to do. Basically what they're doing is they're determining the amount of buying power that's being taken out of the market due to higher prices in gas and food. And what they have determined is that the amount that prices have gone up on those two things is the equivalent of a 78 basis point hike by the Bank of Canada. So in other words, just the higher prices for things are basically the equivalent of the Bank of Canada increasing interest rates three times. And what that is leading to is a conversation around the fact that perhaps, perhaps, they may not have to increase interest rates as much as originally thought because of the higher prices for primarily energy. And yes, food is a big part of this, but what's going on with Ukraine and Russia right now is very, very, very much leading to something that was unexpected and could ultimately have an effect on the economy where interest rates don't need to go up as much as originally expected. And that's because it's putting downward pressure on the economy. Now, who knows what will happen? Obviously, this is a pretty massive surprise. The pandemic was a massive surprise. We don't know what's a year, six months, two years, three years down the road as far as what could come up and surprise us again. But it's really, really interesting. This is an interesting time that we're living in. Obviously, Obviously, we haven't seen inflation like this in 30 or 40 years. And for the most part, people of my generation have lived in a relatively inflation free environment for that amount of time. So these are all things that are new to people and specifically the millennial generation. And it's going to be interesting to see how we handle it going forward, because the single biggest factor right now that will lead to either a recession or more inflation or maybe another boom is psychology. We've seen this in the real estate market recently. We've seen this pretty much nationwide in the US and Canada. The psychology of the citizens is probably going to be what leads to either really good things happening or really bad things happening. And I have to think that with all the talk of higher energy costs, with people seeing $2 gas at the pumps and higher food prices, at some point, the general public is going to have to look at this and say, okay, this doesn't make sense anymore. I'm feeling strapped for cash and we'll stop spending money the way that they've been spending it, which will ultimately lead to that recession. Now, at the beginning of this video, I talked about the fact that I would give you three tips on what to do in order to prepare yourself for a recession, whether it shows up or not, we don't know. But here are the three things I would suggest you do. First and foremost, any goods that are things that you absolutely need to use, if you can get them on sale at any given time, buy them and buy them in bulk if you have room to store them. The reason why is because that is an after tax return. You've already paid taxes on the money that you used to buy those goods. And if you can get a 30 to 50% discount on things like toilet paper, well, that's a 30 to 50% return on your money. It means your money will stretch that much further. So that's the first thing I recommend right now to everybody is if you can get things on sale, 
buy them on sale. And if they're things that will last a long period of time and you absolutely would buy them anyways, buy them in bulk. Yes, you're gonna tie up some cash, but it's the best return on your money that you will ever get. The stock market and everything else cannot catch up to the returns that you would have on that. The next thing that I would suggest that you do is start taking money and putting it aside now. If you don't already have a plan set up so that money automatically comes out of your bank account when you get paid and goes into an RSP or a TFSA or some other form of investment, then make sure you do that and set it up right now for two reasons. One is if we do hit a recession, you aren't going to set that up in the middle of a recession because you aren't going to have enough money or you're not going to feel like you have enough money to do it. So now is the time to do it. And if we do hit a recession and let's say it's six months out, a year out, three years out, if you've been putting away a hundred or 200 or 500 or a thousand dollars a month, well, you'll have that money available to you if things get bad in the economy. And I think that is hugely, hugely important. So do that now, take that step immediately. And even if you don't have $10 a month to put aside, go ahead and just put a little bit aside, start setting it up so it's automatic and work your way up until you get to the point where you're putting a substantial amount of your income away. Typically, we recommend people aim for 10 to 20%. That's the standard financial numbers. I know for us, we put away substantially more than that. And for most people, if you are willing to give up some of the luxuries in life, it is possible to put away a pretty significant amount of your income if you just decide that you don't need to keep up to the Joneses and you wanna live a really good life, but also not have to worry about money. And then last but not least, because this is a mortgage channel, of course, and a real estate channel, I recommend you get your mortgage right. If you have a mortgage that's coming up for renewal in the next little while, if you have a mortgage that maybe you could get a lower rate on, I highly recommend that you take a look at that and try to save as much money as you possibly can. And if you're a year or two out from your renewal, but you think interest rates are going to go up, well, then it might be a good time to look at doing an early renewal or refinancing now so that you can lock in a rate for an extended period of time in order to make sure that you aren't going to find yourself in a position where you're paying higher rates at renewal. But of course, you know, I typically recommend adjustable and variable. One of the fastest and easiest ways for people to save money right now is to get an adjustable or a variable rate mortgage and start putting away the difference between the fixed rate payment and the variable rate payments. But you can find all that information on another video from another day. As for right now, those are my three things I recommend for you. Whether a recession is imminent or not, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're set up and you're ready for it if it does eventually happen. And if it doesn't happen, well, then you're in an even better place because you've prepared for something that didn't happen. And maybe you go and you take an extra vacation a year or you do something really, really great with that money, like save it for retirement so you're not poor then. But either way, it makes a lot of sense to set yourself up financially for the future. And by the way, the last thing I recommend, and I always recommend this, is the number one financial metric that you should be tracking, even if you're tracking nothing at all right now, is your net worth. Because if you focus on just that and increasing it every single day, then you will be able to put more money away over time, reduce your debts, and find yourself in a significantly better place. That one was a bonus. So if you found this video useful, do me that favor, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. Please hit that like button so more people like you can see this video and we'll see you on the very next one. Cheers. Welcome back.